So that brings us to the most common reason for failing the driving test. And that is not making effective observation at junctions. And this has been the same number one reason for at least a good 15, possibly even 20 years. Every year it's the same. Not making effective observations at junctions. So the sub points for this are failing to judge the speed of an approaching vehicle when you turn either left or right from a minor road. So we're emerging at a T junction. You make observations, but fail to judge the speed of an approaching vehicle and make it slow down significantly. So for the ADI part three, do we give them reference points? Could you walk from here to the centre of the road? Could you walk from here to the opposite pavement before that car got to us? Because this can be both ways. So if you're emerging onto a 50 road, everything coming down there is going to be doing 50. So it's not just the case of getting out. You've got to get out and get to 50 miles an hour before the car gets to you. If the car is approaching you, can you at least get to the center white line before that car gets to you? If the answer is no, don't go. But also we can teach them to look for gaps, not cars. Just think, would I just walk across at this point? No, he's, he's razzing down the road. So don't go to go in the car then. Would you walk across at this point? Good grief, I could hop across at this point. Good, so let's go then. For the part two, do we find ourselves doing that? That as we pull out, we think, oh dear, and then have to boot it and perhaps go, sorry. If we do, then we're not ready for the part two because this is a straight fail and this is one of the most common reasons that people fail their test. The second sub point, entering a roundabout with a vehicle approaching to the right. When, the, when you approach a roundabout, there is a vehicle on the right, but you still enter the roundabout, causing the vehicle to slow down. Let's have a look at that in action. So again, for the part three, the standards check, can we give them a reference point, a focal point? So we generally tend to say, think of the roundabout as a clock. If the car is at or before the three o'clock point, we can go. If the car is after the three position, then we need to give way to it. Are they confused on the part three and standards check because the car's in the right hand lane? So because it's in the right hand lane, they think, oh, it's going all the way around. Can we explain to them? But if that car's come from opposite and he's going right, third exit, he's going to be in the right hand lane, then he's going to move across. And if we're pulling out, he's going to go into the front of us. What if they've seen them come from the road on the right? OK, but what if that road, as we've said earlier, has the road signs or the road markings where to come straight ahead towards us is right hand lane? So he's going to be in the right hand lane, hug the roundabout and he's still going to come in front of us. This is one of the reasons this happens. They don't judge the speed and position of the vehicle or they just think the vehicle's in the right lane, he's not coming this way and they go to pull out in front of it. For the ADI part two, do we do that? If a vehicle's in the right lane, do we think, oh, I can go, but then suddenly that vehicle ends up behind us? 
because he was actually turning right he wasn't going all the way around the roundabout if it is then that shows we wouldn't pass the ADI part 2 for the ADI part 3 if that happens with your pupils you need to explain like we've just said what's their position what if they're going right uh, coming towards us they're going to be in the right lane what if they've come from opposite there but that lane says straight ahead is right hand lane so we need to let that car pass then go the third sub point making no effective observation at all when you emerge from a junction you make no observations causing the approaching vehicle from the left or right to do an emergency stop to hit to avoid hitting you or the driving examiner uses the dual controls to brake so again that very often means they don't recognize for the part three the standard check they don't recognize the difference between an open junction and a closed junction so they're just looking on approach because you've done open junctions and they're going yeah it's clear well of course it's clear it's closed junction you can't see a thing that's coming so they, they just kind of glance and then they go or they don't realize it's a roundabout and they go to go across it or they don't realize it's a crossroads and go to go across it and they don't look whether it's safe to or not so are you making sure your pupils make effective observations or are you looking for them again it's so common for the part three and the standards check that trainees are becoming up to go left i'm not looking and you see the trainee at the side of me going yeah yeah okay keep going then are you taking my driving test so therefore you shouldn't be looking you should be looking at me to see if i'm doing that and if i'm not doing that you either need to say stop or you need to hit the brake and stop me pulling out because it's no good letting me go around the corner then pulling me up and going i just want to say chris what you did there was incredibly dangerous and we could have caused an accident because the examiner in the back on your part three is going why would you let them do it then so you shouldn't be looking for the gap you should be looking at me or your pupil to know if i'm looking where i should be that's very often why so many fail the part three and the standards check because they're doing all the work they're not teaching me in other words when i get out of the car as the um, examiner do i think the pupil knows more about making observations at junctions than they did before they got in the car and the answer has to be no because the trainee was doing all the observations for me so make sure your pupil first of all recognizes is it an open junction or closed closed so what are we going to do we're going to stop good where are we going to stop just at the white line then where are we going to look uh right left and right good now can we go yes let's go then is this an open junction yes can we see if it's clear yeah can see for miles there's nothing good that's what you need to be looking for the same goes for the part two do you recognize that it's the junction do you look are you showing them how safe you're going to be that's the key for being ready for the adi part two the th uh, fourth sub point making no observations when joining a dual carriageway from a slip road when you're on the slip road you go on to the dual carriageway without making any observations or you don't give way to the traffic on the main carriageway remember coming down the slip road you're crossing the white line you're changing lanes 
So you're meant to be the ones doing mirrors and signal and seeing if it's safe to change lanes. If not, you have to give way to whatever's there. And that's the reason people fail. They look, there is a vehicle alongside, but they keep going anyway. As it says, you don't give way to traffic on the main carriageway. This is part of the number one reason for failing the driving test. So do they realise they're going on to a dual carriageway? How do they know? Have you done this with them? Have you done slip roads on the part three? Do they recognise mirrors, signal, then position? So have you done a briefing for dual carriageways? Do they understand? Or do you just take them down a slip road and let them get on with it? This links back to the mirrors, looking in the mirrors, is the car in the lane next to me? Is it in the furthest lane from me, the fast lane on the dual carriageway so I can move over? Is it in the lane next to me? Yes, so I can't move over. So if there are three vehicles and none of them are slowing down or moving to let you in, you have to be the one to do it, Chris. Oh, wow, didn't know that. You have to look, assess and decide. On the part two, do you do this? Do you recognise, if I said to you now, how do you know you're on a dual carriageway? How do you know you're on a slip road? Is it a slip road that runs parallel? Is it a slip road that means you have to move across? How do I tell the difference? Because once you're on the part three, you need to be able to pass that knowledge on to your learners. But this is one of the most common reasons people fail their test. The next sub point going straight ahead at crossroads. Any trainee who's trained with us will know that unless, especially when we get to the point where I think crossroads is about the ninth or tenth subject, so your commentary driving should be coming along by now. And the, the whole lesson plan is, it's my first time doing crossroads. I've never done them before. You need to teach me about them. And part of the most common reason people fail their driving test is going straight ahead at crossroads. You approach a crossroads, you don't recognize that it is a crossroads and you go to drive across it without making any observations at all. And that's what we do for the part three training. If you don't say to me, looking ahead, Chris, we can see there is a crossroads coming up, especially when you're going from, um, from a minor road, crossing a main road, because very often the main road will have priority through the crossroads, but you still need to teach me. What happens if there's a car there? How do I know if this car is going to pull out? Well, are the wheels moving? We can see the wheels aren't moving. We know he's going to wait and let us through. But then when you're going across the main road, which is where most accidents happen, because they drive across without even knowing it's a crossroad. So how do I identify the crossroads? How do I recognize it? Then how do I deal with it? So would you prefer all driving the auto or driving the menu? Oh, <laughs> okay, so as we're coming up to the crossroads, start crossroads. to slow down, start okay. to... Oh. Crossroads. Is it on? Yeah. Okay, so you can see it's crossroads. So yes. we've got... Okay. So, that was near. That was mm. good, wasn't it? <laughs> Scary than the one it is to be. <laughs> it's good though, because this car just brakes by itself. It's really good. Okay, so I had to apply the brake there. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, because you were coming a bit too fast up to the crossroad. Probably because I didn't tell you that there was crossroads here. Ah. Yeah. Um, but we can work on that. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so at the crossroads, straight ahead, that's all right. we're going to go straight ahead. 
Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to take my foot off the brake. Yeah. So if you'd like to put the foot on the brake for now. Yeah. That's it. So just carry on the normal procedure as we do. Okay. Did you look right ahead, left? No. Okay. Was right. I meant to? Yeah. So oh. if we just come come round on ourselves and we'll go ahead. Oh. Okay. So. Remember when we do our normal mirror signal and positions? Straight ahead at the crossroads. But we go straight ahead at the crossroads, so start to slow down on the approach. So we can't see left or right, so we're going to continue... Uh, straight. Yeah. Okay, so as we've kind of positioned here, so you want to do uh, right, right ahead, left ahead. Okay, so just pull up on the left, okay. yeah, and we'll have a little chat. Okie dokie. So, just taking the, the last crossroads, um, on the approach to the crossroads you moved off to the left a little bit, why was that? Because straight ahead is always left lane. When we did the briefing, can mm. you remember when we were looking um, at the pictures of the the, the crossroads yes. and then we said that if we were going straight ahead, yeah. if it was a wider road yeah. then we would be maybe uh, centre or right of the road. Oh, yes. And then if it was a narrow road, we'd maybe over to the left. Yes. Yeah? So, do you think that by being further over to the left on, on that uh, crossroads, it was more, we had to steer more? Whereas if we'd have stayed in the centre lane... No, that could have been... But I'm not really good on push to the left. Should we, should we get the book out and have a little look? <laughs> and unless you tell me those things, I'm going to keep driving. Now, obviously, when we get to the crossroads, we don't go through them. We stop quickly and I go, oh, wow, is this a crossroads? Oh, yeah, sorry, I should have mentioned it. That's not us being pedantic. That's not us trying to throw you out part of the most common reason across the UK is that people do not recognize crossroads so if you're on your part three or standards check when was the last time you did a dedicated crossroads lesson how do I recognize how many types of crossroads It's actually five how do I recognize an unmarked crossroads how do I deal with a give way, with a stop one? How do I deal with going straight ahead from a minor road to a minor road across the main road? Where do I look? How do I recognise it if there's no sign saying it's a crossroads? Which, to be fair, nine times out of ten there isn't. All that has to be done before I'm driving across it. So for your part three, can you pull your pupil up and say, can you see this ahead, this junction? Do you know what this is? Oh, it's just a normal emerge. Well, is there a road opposite this time? Oh, yeah. Oh, this is a crossroads. Yeah. So how do I then deal with it? Where do I look? Everyone says, right, come up to the crossroads, Chris. Look right, left, right. Now we can go. And that's the end of your part three. That's the end of your part two. Why? Because it's not a T-junction, it's a crossroad. So your observation should be right, ahead, left, ahead, right. What if there's a car coming from opposite? How do I deal with that? Well, if I'm just going, yeah, yeah, it's clear. I found my test. What if there's a car on the main road, comes down, to turn right and stops in front of me and I go yeah 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 I'm gone straight into the side of that car which is what's known as t-boning you end up like a t-bone steak and that is so common because people are only looking two ways it's a crossroads you should be looking all three 
and then make a decision. So for the part three, is that something you do with your learners? If you said to your learner tomorrow, I tell you what, Chris, as we go around, you tell me when we pass an unmarked crossroads. And I bet nine times out of 10, because we have it so much on part three, that you won't recognize where the unmarked crossroads are. And you go, oh man, that's crossroads. I didn't realize that. How many times have I been down this test street? It's the same for your pupils. For the ADI part two, do you look at crossroads and go right ahead, left ahead, right? Do you know how to deal with them? What if you're turning at a crossroads that has no markings in the center? Where do I stop? Where do I turn? There's a couple in Telford and we'll add them just to show you the screenshots of the videos. There's um, the, the Alston Crossroads um, and then there's the what's called the Cock Hotel uh, Crossroads as well. Both are notorious for having many accidents and collisions. And that's the reason why people don't always recognize that it's a crossroads. And if it's an um, unmarked crossroads, if it's not controlled by traffic lights, they just drive across it. So the next sub point, looking too late. When you emerge from a junction, you look too late to the left or right for the observation to be effective. So in other words, if you're emerging left at a T junction and for the ADI part three, watch how often your pupils do this. Now, again, this comes back to are you watching the pupil or are you looking for traffic? Because if you're looking for traffic, you're doing it wrong. You should be looking at your pupil. For the part two, assess your driving. How many times do you do this? You'll come up to go left at a T-junction uh, and you'll look to the right and then follow it around. So just as you're turning is when you're looking left. It's too late. You need to look right, left, right. Got to look left. Is there a car parked on the corner? Is there a person crossing? Is there a car parked opposite so that any vehicles coming towards you are actually on your side of the road? You need to know that before you emerge. And even if you go around that corner and it's empty and clear, the reason it's a fail is the examiner is saying, well, it's only luck that there wasn't a 40 ton Arctic coming past the parked car. So you would have now gone head to head with it. So effective observations at junctions for the part three standards check. Are you looking at your pupil at that point or are you looking to make sure it's safe? That's what your pupil should be doing, not you. You can look afterwards or you can look as they do it, but your prime focus for the ADI part three needs to be your pupil. For the part two, again, video yourself, put your phone on, put the dash cam towards you. Are you doing that? Are you going around the corners, just looking one way and then just looking as you go? Remember, minimum observation is right, left, right again, then decide whether to go. And the final sub point in this number one reason, repeatedly not looking left when turning left. Throughout the test, when you turn left from a minor road into a busier road, you don't make any effective observations to the left. This means you're unaware of any parked vehicles, obstructions or other possible hazards. So this time, at least you're looking uh, to the right a bit more. Uh, but there is absolutely no look to the left, as we've just mentioned. So you go around and that's it until you're in the new road and then you do it. Again, that's not acceptable. Minimum observation for part two, minimum observation for part three, minimum observation for standards check is right, left, 
right again. And you should be able to look at your pupil and see them go right, left, right. Now I can go. If your head is coming back and you're looking if it's clear, you won't pass the part three. You won't pass your standards check. If you're doing that on your part two, you won't pass. Remember, it's about how safe you're going to be, not how quickly you get round. So we hope this video has helped you to understand the top 10 reasons that people fail and how it can help you for your ADI part two. It can help you for your ADI part three. It can help you for your standards check test. Remember, use MSPSGL if you're in a manual, MSPSL if you're in an automatic, and there will be nothing that your pupil does that you won't be able to spot. But by looking and getting to know this list, the um, link for this on the website is in the description. The link for the folders, if you need them, such as the dual carriageway one, the motorway one, overtaking, is in the description as well. So thanks for joining us today. My name is Chris from Driver Training Limited. Remember, if you've enjoyed this, leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. If there's something you'd like to, for us to cover, let us know, we'd be happy to do that as well. So remember, as always, teach well, drive safely, and we'll see you all again in our next video.